Sunday also I'm going to talk to you a bit about why we do what we do and why you and I are involved in missions. And um, I, I'm going to give you a bit of a warning. I really had a revelation. Um, and that's what I'm going to share with you this week. But what God spoke to me. And now he speaks to you, hopefully through me. Um, some of you might get a bit disturbed. How's that for a warning? Uh, you, you, you may not be comfortable. Uh, but it's the word of God. And it, it came in a whole new way. Uh, about why we do what we do. And, and about mission. I've titled it Why Missions. Probably a better title I was thinking later on would have been the motivation for ministry and missions. Right? What is our motivation? And motivation is a good thing to have in life. I remember the story about a rich, wealthy tycoon and he was giving a lavish party and uh, in his estate and he invited the whole village to come. And he had a big swimming pool. So before the people came, he put some kind of man-eating alligators into the swimming pool. And as the people came for the party, he announced to all the young men there, he said, all of you young men, I have a challenge for you. If any one of you will jump to this pool and swim from this side to that side to the end, I will give you one of three things. I will give you 1,000 acres of my oil fields. Or if you don't want that, I will give you 10,000 head of cattle from my cattle. Now if you don't want both of those, I have one more thing to give you. And that is the hand of my daughter in marriage. As he said that, one guy jumped in and started swimming. And he swam, swam, swam frantically. And he swam from this end through the alligators right to that side. And he got up. And the man, was, man said, come here, come here, son. That's so great. He says, what do you want? Do you want the thousand acres of my oil fields? The guy said, no. He said, do you want 10,000 head of my cattle? He said, no. Oh, he said, then I know. You want the hand of my daughter? The guy said, no, no, no. He said, then what do you want, son? He said, the only thing I want to know is, I want to know who is the devil who pushed me into the water. <laughs> you see, motivation is a fantastic thing. This guy was motivated because of the alligators who swim across, right? He didn't ask for it. But when we look at our lives and we look at where we are going, I want us to talk about Motivation for ministry and missions. You know, we are in, for those of you visiting with us, we are in the book of Acts this year. And uh, our theme is not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. By my Spirit, says the Lord. Right? And um, to, to, to go along the theme, we looked at the book of the Holy Spirit, which is the book of Acts. And um, we've been in the book of Acts. I think this is our, what is this, our fifth um, lesson. And we're still in chapter 1. We haven't gone past verse 11 in a sense. But we are going from the theme. So we are pulling from here and there a bit also. Now in Acts 1, 4, right? Jesus has died on the cross, paid the price, resurrected from the dead. And appeared to the disciples, right? And in that period that he was there with them, he began to give them instruction. And in Acts 1, 4, it says, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem until the Father's promise, right, is received by them. Until the Father sends his promise. And then in John, uh, in, in Acts 1, 5, he said, John baptized with water. But there is a greater baptism of fire, of power, of the Holy Spirit that is coming upon you. And then in Acts 1, 6 and 7, the disciples didn't basically care what he was saying. He was giving them instruction. He was going to empower them to do what he wanted them to do. But they were more interested in when their throne would come. Right? And then he said, that's not for you to know. Now we're going to read three verses, right? 
four verses actually 8 9 10 11 acts 1 8 9 10 and 11 but you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in jerusalem throughout judea in samaria and to the ends of the earth after saying this he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him as they strained to see him rising into heaven two white robed men suddenly stood among them men of galilee they said why are you standing here staring into heaven jesus has been taken from you into heaven but some day he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go jesus had been taken from you and the same way he went you will see him coming back now we don't hear a lot of sermons about the coming of the lord in fact i was reading this week a survey taken in a western country of a pastors conference they said 90% of the pastors who were there don't believe that jesus christ is coming back that shows you the 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 breakdown of christianity in in some of the so called christian nations of the world and and we can see what is happening the enemy comes against to nullify god's word you know some people say we are word churches actually some of them are not word churches they are favorite word churches we want some of the bible we like some of these they's become our favorites but god wants us to look at the whole counsel of god i want you today to follow along with me i don't want you to get bored i don't want you to get lazy i don't want you to start wandering your mind remember this one and a half hours in the whole week right we have many other things to do give it another time try to remain focused i really believe god gave me a revelation it's not new obviously some others may have had it before and known it but i want you to follow along because i believe it is for us and it is for now and uh, in acts 1 11 the second part says this and reading from the new king james the same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven now this is the motivation for everything that we do right i see in the book of acts the motivation is very clear right the the disciples had been given the message they had been given the might or the power they had been instructed with the mission but from verse 9 to 11 we see that the motivation for all mission and all ministry is given what is the motivation jesus is coming back jesus is coming back i want you to get this you know we come to church sometimes and we do our part and we slip away we fulfill god's call if you can if you don't if you can't then we still get by we hide behind somebody else's ministry sometimes we get behind because our grandmother was a devout person sometimes but i want you to know that jesus christ is coming back and we are going to face him individually we're going to face him individually this jesus has been taken away from you into heaven but some day he will return in the same way you saw him go in the next few moments i want to talk to you about the lord's return you know not in the terms of signs of the times we we did that already i'm not going to talk to you about the end times and the signs of the end time i want to talk to you about what it means when it says jesus is coming back what does it mean to you to me what does it mean to us as christians the first one when jesus returns believers i'm not talking about non christians i'm not talking about those who don't know christ this morning right when jesus returns believers will have to give an account believers will have to give an account believers will have to give an account when jesus returns he's going to want us to give an account he's going to want to know what you and i did with the resources that he gave us when jesus comes he's going to want to know about what we did 
with the talents what we did with our abilities what we did even with the gospel that we received that millions haven't even had he's going to want to know he wants an account if you look at Matthew 25 we have the story about the talents right let's read Matthew 25 14 and 15 again the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone he gave five bags of silver to one two bags of silver to another and one bag of silver to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities he then left on his trip so he gives five bags two bags and one bag right and sometimes we have a big problem with these bags why are they so blessed why don't i have their talent you know why is that one like this and we are so busy worried about what the other person has but we don't realize that he divided it in proportion to the abilities he had a plan god is not expecting to collect a return from you on what he has not given you god is not interested in what you don't have god is only interested in what you do have in what he has given you and god gives you according to what he sees fit when god compares at the end of it god is not going to compare you to the five or the three or the two or the one he's going to compare you only to what you have been got but he comes back he gives them i'm not preaching the 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 the, the parable of the talents that's another whole sermon but i'm i'm talking to you about the reward he comes back let's read Matthew 25:19 After a long time the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them He returned and settled accounts You see the story is the same This Jesus who left and went is coming back the same way He's coming back you have to give an account I have to give an account right and in this story he came back and and we know the story number 5 and 2 multiplied number 1 didn't but but that's a whole another story but we have to give an account because this jesus is coming back the disciples understood at that moment that there will be an accounting and all of us who are christians will one day stand before the lord friend listen to me all of us individually you can't hang, hang you can't say my family was okay or my father was pastor colton so you know i am going to be in that shadow no all of us individually have to give an account we have to give an account we will give an account of the way we spent our time we will give an account of the ministry we did or the ministry we did not do we will give an account of how we use the resources the talent the money and the time that he gave us you know luke 1248 luke 1248 says this when someone has been given much much will be required in return and when someone has been entrusted with much even more will be required you see to whom much is given much is required the more blessed you are the more responsibility you have you see god sees you fit that's why he blesses you you didn't you're not a special person who fell from heaven and god smiled on you no god sees you fit god gives according to everybody's ability and god blesses you so because to whom much is given god holds us required for much we are we, we have to be more responsible in what god wants so the first one is very very important right when jesus comes back when jesus comes back he we will have to give an account amen the second thing is when jesus returns believers will be judged sometimes we think judgment is only for the unbeliever believers also will be judged right after the rapture of the church of the lord right the lord will judge believers the, the lord is going to judge us individually revelation 22:12 look 
I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to pay all people according to their deeds. I'm coming soon. I am coming. I am judging and I'm giving a reward to everyone. Right? According to their deeds. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says this. This is Paul the Apostle writing to Timothy, right? His son in the faith. Uh, in one of the last books, uh, last letters he wrote, uh, 2 Timothy is supposed to be the last one. This is what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So here I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now on that last day, the crown of righteousness from the righteous judge. How many of you are happy that we have a righteous judge? Huh? All the stories you read, all the things you hear. Sri Lanka always doesn't have righteous judgments given. We have a lot of unrighteous judgments given also. But here it talks about a righteous judge who will do his deeds and, and give us the price. Now on that day we will be judged, the day that Jesus comes, right? Following that day believers will give an account to God. I hope you are following along with me, right? I told you you had to stay with me on this. I'm going to use many scriptures. I'm going to walk you this because I really felt this is something God wants revealed to you and me. Some of you already know it, so you re-reveal to you. But to remind you of what God is saying, right? On what are we going to be judged on? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So here he's talking about judgment. Now I'm going to do two side things here. I'm going to explain to you what the judgment seat of Christ means. Right? Standing before Christ, the judge, the righteous judge as you go along, right? So write that down in A. It's the judgment seat of Christ. Right? The judgment seat of Christ. Some of you, you've heard these words, heard the names but not really looked at what it means, right? The judgment seat of Christ, right? There is a place called the judgment seat of Christ, okay? It's where all believers will stand before Christ. Now in Romans 14.10, Romans 14.10 says this. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all stand before the judgment seat of God. So... You are saying now, what kind of accounting is going to be that? Right? I'll tell you why you're worried about it. Because this is after the church has been taken. This is once we get to heaven and, and, and we, we meet up with Christ. We are going to judgment. And a lot of the time the word judgment has been used and, and, uh, in a different way or, or in one way that we get the wrong idea. Now some of you think that the moment... You know, we stand before God. God will replay all the bad things we have done and all the good things and then weigh them out. Right? That will be the judgment. Or when we get to heaven's gates, Peter will open the book and see whether our name is there in the Lamb's book of life and who goes in and who doesn't. And we think that that is the judgment. Right? But all those are a result of a misunderstanding of the term that comes with the judgment seat of Christ. The phrase judgment seat, in the Greek, they use the word the bima. It's called bima, right? Bima refers to a raised platform. Right? All these things I tell you about Greek and all, if you even don't have biblical theological books, go on Google, it might tell you what it is, right? It gives you the meaning of the original text, right? You know what bima means? Bima means steps leading to a raised platform steps leading to a raised platform bima the bima is a seat of dignity the bima is a seat where where somebody honorable sits there right a, a dignitary sits there 
so it's it's important now in the corinthians they had no problem in understanding this because uh, in 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 corinth outside of corinth actually there was a very large olympic stadium and and athletes all over greece would come there to compete and when they come to compete there would be a bema steps leading to a platform and on the bema is where the honoring happened of, of the athletes who competed in those games so it's a seat of prominence honor and dignity and that is called the bema i i'm explaining this for a purpose because this is what i want to get through this evening this morning bema is not a place of judgment in terms of penalty it's rather a place of dignity can you say amen amen you see you're not going to get all the way to heaven stand in the judgment seat of christ and be condemned and you're not going to go to the judgment seat of christ and be humiliated i want to tell you salvation is so great when you are saved you don't understand it takes you out into a whole new realm the judgment seat of christ is for your praise it's to praise you it's to exalt you it's to lift you up it's to honor you first corinthians 4:5 let's read first corinthians 4:5 so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the lord returns for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives then god will give to each one whatever praise is due then god will give to each one whatever praise is due that is what happens at the bema in heaven right so that's the judgment seat of christ the second thing i want to quickly give you is authority and accountability authority and accountability write the word authority there right i just want to explain this to you that we need to understand authority and accountability in this run on our lives you know we are living the life we are moving forward but we need to understand this romans 14 10 to 12 says this so why do you condemn another believer why do you look down on another believer remember we will all stand before the judgment seat of god for the scripture says as surely as i live says the lord every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to god yes each of us will give a personal account to god so you know if you look at all the scriptures it keeps telling us don't judge don't judge don't judge your brother don't judge your sister don't judge because invariably we judge wrong we don't see god is going to judge god has a judging plan right god will complete his word don't judge don't judge don't you neighbor and say don't judge turn to your other neighbor and say don't judge now turn to god and say judge me if i'm not turning to anybody don't judge because verse 12 yes each one of us will give a personal account to god each one of us church please listen to me some of the christianity in this church is ohe palaya i'm just going there is a slope i'm going pallame ohe ano i am going behind so and so thank god my pastor is thank god my mother was a good christian thank no there is nothing like that god has a specific plan for you how many of you are happy that christ didn't, didn't just didn't die for a bunch of people but he died for you he died for me how many can say thank god personally christ died for me let me see your hands amen That's why that song, you know, that that we sing says when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Amen. When he was on the cross, I me, Dishan, I was on his mind. He died for me. In the same way, I not Colton and because I am Colton's son, I am going to be shaped up. No, I Dishan will have to give an account to god because of what he has done for me put your name in there every believer is going to give an account to god the lord knows that you and i respond to that kind of motivation what is the kind of motivation that we are held accountable that we are 
held in authority and because there is authority and accountability then we respond to that kind of motivation do you know that authority and accountability have a wonderful effect on us do you believe that i'll give you an example you're driving down the road you're hammering away in your vehicle you're kadagana going right you're hammering and suddenly you see a cop there or suddenly you see a police car what do you do what do you do you slow down why authority and accountability right it's a motivation to do right it's a motivation to go to the speed limit so i i want you to understand this that's why authority and accountability are put when you when you go to work if there is no authority in your job and no accountability you will be a lazy slob you will be not on time you won't deliver you won't meet your targets you won't be doing anything right but because there is authority and accountability you become a good worker you know tonight this morning i'm talking about motivation for missions motivation for ministry it's not yeah i'll try to do some ministry that's the thing to do no everybody is doing it i must do my part no there is a reason for us being where we are on this earth god has a plan i want to tell you so we have to be accountable i want to tell you one day church listen to me one day you not anybody else and me are going to stand before the one whose eyes burn as fire the one who has hair as wool and his name is Jesus Christ and we are going to be accountable to him we can fool man we can impress so and so we can look good in front of so and so but i want to tell you our final accountability comes in what jesus christ when we stand before jesus christ and i listen to me this is what i want to get through to you again this morning when you stand before jesus christ and you are accountable right the issue is not whether you were saved or not saved when you stand before jesus christ the issue is not whether you had unconfessed sin or confessed sin when you stand before jesus christ the issue won't be how much you sinned or did not sin after you got saved that does not happen at the judgment seat of christ that does not happen in that accountability hey all that was paid on the cross how many can say hallelujah i mean once you're saved my friend you're saved god saves you he brings you into the kingdom and you have to have that security in knowing that the blood of jesus has washed your sins you don't have to worry about that that's not what you're going to give account you know I, i i i'm going to say this here the danger of losing my assemblies of god license <laughs> but i i'm going to say this you know just because you've lived the 40 years of of your life uh, working for god believing in god and and and, and you know uh, living for him and a moment before you die you create you you just fall into one sin or or you do some stupid thing you're not going to go to hell you think after 40 years of living for him just because you made one mistake he's going to banish you to hell it will never happen you can take me up on this privately i'm telling you it will never happen because my security is in my salvation of what jesus has done for me now if you reject him if you walk away from him if you say no i don't care about the blood of jesus i don't want to be his child again and if you reject him you will be 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 banished from him he is not going to hammer you over to hell because you made one slip you see so at the judgment seat of christ it's not a case of how much sin you did or you didn't do okay then my question is then what will you be judged on what is all this judging on let's go to the final point when jesus returns number 
believers values will be tested you see the judgment seat of christ is not for the purpose of deciding whether your life was morally good or morally evil the judgment seat of christ is not to see whether you did more good or more bad it's simply the judgment seat of christ is simply to take the components of your life as a believer and see if any of them had eternal value or not to see if any of them had eternal value or not first corinthians 3 let's read 10 to 15 because of god's grace to me I have laid the foundation like an expert builder now others are building on it but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have Jesus Christ anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials gold silver jewels wood hay or straw But on the judgment day fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done the fire will show if a person's work has any value if the work survives that builder will receive a reward but if the work is burned up the builder will suffer great loss the builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames I hope you listen to that carefully it says a lot of things as Christians we have a choice we build our life now when you build your life the bible says you build it with silver gold precious stones with wood hay and stubble or grass okay so those are the six things said so you build your life you invest you put money you put time you get, you you lose sleep you fast and pray you seek god for guidance in all the things you do and you build your life you're building in six things precious stones silver gold or wood hay and grass you may need all six to build your life but then the bible goes on to say that the judgment of fire is coming and when the judgment of fire comes to evaluate your life and to see where you placed value in your life if you put value in the wood stubble and hay it'll all get burnt up now it doesn't say you're going to hell what does the last few lines say there the last few lines say you will be still saved but it will be like somebody who barely escaped the fire and came through humbing beruna you just barely made it that's what it's saying you see this is the revelation god is given me that i'm giving you is that you need to evaluate your life where are you putting your money where are you putting your time where are you putting your prayers where are you what are you fasting about are you fasting for wood stubble and hay or are you fasting for silver gold and precious stones you see there are two things in our lives temporal and eternal unfortunately the church of jesus christ we give more to the temporal than we do to the eternal and god wants us to build our lives with gold silver and precious stones he wants us not to put so much energy into the temporal things some of you are dying over some things that if you die tomorrow it won't matter it's all finished but when you invest in the eternal only in death that you will receive even those rewards because they are forever I know this is probably not the most entertaining sermon you've heard from me. Maybe you're not even excited, but I want to tell you it's revelation. It's a revelation to where we are putting our energies. You see God wants us to take our resources, the time, the money, the talents, the opportunities he's given us. And as they pass through the fire of discernment that we will know and see that we have invested 
in the right things the tragedy for so many christians will be that the moment they realize that they wasted their resources in how they live their life in temporary things meaningless insignificant you know what happens suddenly remorse and regret and sorrow comes over every missed opportunity some of you are saying but pastor there is no sorrow in heaven well i want to tell you my bible says that he will wipe away each tear in heaven i think there is going to be some kind of a thing that gets to us to to see that you know we wasted the opportunities god has given us now don't get me wrong the bible doesn't say build your life only with with uh, silver gold and precious stones it says there'll be wood stubble and hay you need everything to build this life in the natural but where do you put your biggest values in and that is what the bible is taking us to 2 corinthians 5:11 says this because we understand our fearful responsibility to the lord we work hard to persuade others god knows we are sincere and i hope you know this too paul the apostle was laying it down he was letting them know what is most important and the disciples stood on that mountain looking up to heaven in acts 1:11 this is what it says the same jesus who was taken up from you the angel said will so come in like manner as you saw him go he's coming back to the mount of olives that's where he went from those of you who've been to israel you know where the mount of olives is and when jesus was taken up that's the same place he's coming back to those of you who haven't been to israel in november we're doing another trip and i'll i'll put the dates out and and you can come uh, if you if you can save from now it will be good but that's not my point my point is that mount of olives is so significant that he is coming back there and when he comes back you and i are going to give an account you know in acts 1 2 he gave them instructions i given you three things he did he gave them instructions acts 1 2 he commanded them in acts 1 2 in acts 1 8 he gave them the power when the holy spirit comes upon you i will I, the, the the power will come upon you and in acts 1 11 he gives them the motivation you know what it is the motivation is he is coming back